My name is Barbara Murphy. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for HGST. For those of you that don't know who HGST are, we are the number one enterprise brand of disk drive used in virtually every major storage system in the world. We are also a sister company to a brand that many of you are probably very familiar with, which is GTEC. And we are a wholly owned, all of us are owned by Western Digital, a local company here um, in uh, Southern California, who is the number one disk drive vendor in the world as well. And what I want to talk to you uh, today about is, I want you to go away from this room scared and worried and thinking about your data storage growth. And the reason that's so important is because as human beings, we are extremely good at thinking linearly, and we are lousy at presenting and thinking exponentially. Case in point, 401ks. Everybody's like, yeah, I'll put it after tomorrow. I don't need to worry about it. It'll grow, and I'll put it in next year. So every penny you don't put in today, for those of you, and this is my subtitle, for every penny you don't put in your 401k today has an exponential impact when you hit retirement. So what has that got to do with data growth? Well, I want to tell you that the exponential problem with your 401k that you all ignore is exactly the same exponential problem you have with your data storage, that it's just too hard to figure out, so we put off till tomorrow. So when we talk about data storage growth, everybody says it's the it's the media devices. You know, it's going from SD to HD. That's what's causing the problem. Well, I contend not. It's what's happening in the process of making film, making content. And to begin with, if you think back, if we never figured out how to store visual content, if we never figured out how to store art form, we'd all still be looking at live actors on stage. But we figured out how to put it on tape, and then we figured out how to put it on disc. But once we have it on disc, what we can now do with that content, that original piece of IP that was created, is what's creating the huge explosion in data growth. So there's, first of all, just the basics of the contents, and I'll talk about that and how that affects growth. But then there's the fact that we now have a user profile where the consumption of your IP is happening in so many different ways compared to how it used to be 100 years ago when people were going to the film and watching a reel. And then there's a new emerging class of co content management and content monetization, which is using analytics to bring intelligence into the, into the content that you're creating, which, by the way, is so expensive to begin with that you want to take every way possible to be able to monetize that content. And this becomes greatly important in the future. And then we have things like automation in terms of helping with the content flow. And lastly, but uh, not least, the media workflows. So let's start with the basics, which is, oh, it's the fact that we went from SD to HD. Yes, this has had a huge impact in the amount of content that's actually being created. To give you a simple example, um, 4K video is about, of raw, uncompressed video, is about 2.2 petabytes of storage. When, and it's not a case of if, it's a case of when we go to 8K, you are now talking about 9 petabytes, almost, of uncompressed storage. That is not a 2x improvement, it is a 4x, and that is my exponential problem, getting back to my 401k story. But ultimately, what we got to understand is that the ingest, the storage, then the processing, the playout, and the archiving, all are a cumulative process for that original piece of IP that was created. And, you know, it's not a case of if we move to higher densities, it's a case of when we move to higher densities because we all know that you know, HD had a huge impact in the quality of the product that you were producing. And moving to 4K has an even greater impact and it is about delighting. That's what we do in the entertainment in industry is we take content, original content, and we delight. But the other issue is, it's all the other things you're doing with the data in the process. 
It's the formats that I talked about. It's versioning. It's the fact that there's multiple copies. It's the fact that you have a, a, somebody who wants to keep a local copy on their GTEC drive on their desktop because they don't entirely trust that they'll get the data back from you. Um, um, does this sound familiar to anybody? And then, you know, there's the fact that we now want to add new capabilities on top of that because it is so darn expensive to create this content to begin with that you better know how to monetize every last piece of it so that you're not investing in episodic versions that really don't generate a lot of money for you and you are putting your dollars into the places where it really matters. And so let's talk about formats. You know, this is something that really didn't exist you know, 10, 15 years ago, this was not a problem. It was a, a small problem, but it was not a, a big problem. We have so many different types. We have Microsoft formats, we have Google formats, we have Avid formats, we have Apple formats. We have different media that people are actually watching um, the content on. And we don't know where it's going to go tomorrow, but assuredly of one thing, it's not going to become less, it's going to become more. And each one of these formats means a new method of transcoding, right? So you have a question to ask yourself as the guy who's responsible for managing that data. Do I, do I just back up the original format um, or do I back up all the transcoded formats? And then what happens when I have a situation where I've made a slight modification in a movie because for a regional specific need, they wanted it done a certain way, well, now you have a new version of that that also has to be transcoded. And then you have the big question of, do I back that up? The combination of all of this is where the exponential growth in data is coming from. It's not from those original you know, transitions from one, one media, <clears throat> like HD to 4K. Um, from a company perspective, you know, we look at data kind of in five different states. You know, there's the data that is in use, um, you're doing something with it, you know, whether it's reading, writing, or whatever. And then there's the data that's in motion, and that's the data that's moving from one media to another, or moving from your core media or your data lake to some um, formatting systems. Then you have data at rest. The data at rest is data that has kind of gone past the main editing part, but you need to keep that data around and some storage device and keep it online and available. And next there's kind of your archive, and this is now your, you know, you're past the need for keeping the data around in the short term, but are you prepared to put that data in some frozen state, in some archive that it can never be touched again? So that's another key area that you have with your data. And then there's the last state of data, which is data deleted. Really? Come on. How many people actually are willing to commit to deleting data? Because how do you face your film producer and explain to him that you, that piece of data hadn't been touched in a year? So I just got rid of it. That doesn't really happen. So you can expect that the individuals in your organization who are responsible for managing the data through its life cycle, the last thing they ever want to do is push the delete button. As a result, you can fully expect that whatever anticipated growth you had in your storage um, is going to be a lot more than you had actually originally forecasted it would be. From a company perspective, we really like to look at um, the media workflows in terms of you know, how we translate that into technology and what it means for you. Obviously, first up is the acquiring and capturing, which is really, you know, that's your one-time opportunity because it's not like you can go back next week and ask Angelina Jolie to reshoot the scene that you've just done. You don't get those opportunities, so that's critical. And then we move into the, you know, the posting, the collaboration, um, and the post-production of that workflows. And then finally, you get to the playout stage where you're distributing that data. And last but not least, you're moving to archive. So that's kind of the workflow generically. From a data perspective, though, what that means has dramatically different ways 
about how you manage and build your infrastructure. So beginning that acquisition stage, it's all about super hot data. Um, as you move to the, you know, the middle of the workflows in the post-production stage, it's colder data, um, not, you know, not necessarily in the same critical stage. And then as you archive it off, it effectively is frozen in time. Data that you can't get rid of, that you won't get rid of, but is essential to keep around in your archives. And from a technology perspective, you've got to be considering the workflows in terms of SSD and memory and cache as dealing with that very hot data. Um, and things like, you know, SAN, tier two SAN and NAS for your mid-tier areas. And finally, um, I contend, and this is the big transition that I, I believe is going to occur, is archive was a tape-based world. And that is really going to move to an object store, and you'll see why shortly. Because from a data protection perspective, it's all about, um, you know, UPS, battery backup, um, multi-path virtualization on the front end, and then, you know, traditional RAID in the center where you have your um, file systems being managed by um, a NAS. And at the back end, erasure coding becomes essential in managing that data path. From a latency perspective, by the way, latency is the killer of this in industry. And the reason why is because as formats get richer and richer, naturally latencies go up. So now you have to contend on how you change your workflow to manage those higher latencies that naturally occur as the rich richness of the data in, um, occurs with how you, you actually overcome those. And so it is literally in nanoseconds. And later as I talk about um, edge analytics, you'll see why that's so important. From uh, the, you know, the post-production stage, you can work in microseconds, that's okay. That works fine. And then at your archive stage, today, if you're in a tape world, your timeline is days. But there's an opportunity to change that to being minutes. And that has a big impact on how you reuse and reutilize your extremely valuable video assets. Because as long as they're on um, a live object archive type of environment, your ability to be able to reuse and refactor changes dramatically compared to when you're in a purely tape world. And so from an archiving perspective, this is one of the big changes that we'll see in workflows is embedding an online archive into your workflow so that you can massively reuse and remonetize your assets. And so everybody today, you know, has been talking about the massive data growth. And I love this slide from Tom Coughlin. He does great work in terms of, you know, helping you understand that we have a data growth problem. So the, the you know, compounded annual growth rate for data is 40%. The problem with this number is there is nobody out there who's 40%. You're probably in one of two um, extremes. Your data growth is in the low teens. Why? Maybe you're not doing so well. Maybe the studio is just not producing hits. But on the other end, if you have a hit on your hand, your data growth rate is not at 40%. It's at 80 to 100 to 150%. This is the problem with this number when you look at it and think you can plan for this. If you have a hit on your hand, you're not going to be growing at 40%. Because the way you want to be able to fastly turn around your assets to keep up with the timelines that you have from an episodic perspective means that you have to have the ability to be able to manage your data at the 100 percentile, not at the 40 percentile. And so if you look at the workflows, we have another challenge in our hands. In different Groups have different design objectives. In the advertising world, it might be just you know, fast access to production dailies. Um, by contrast, in the film world, where you have massive amounts of data being collected, it's about you know, scaling 
far that massive growth in from you know 4K video, um, and how to sco store multi petabytes, um, and it's about tiering for efficiency. So that as uh, Tom talked about, how do you get access to cheaper tiers of storage as you move through that workflow? Um, if you're in the broadcast industry, it's about real time and about automation. Different problems, different workflows, different storage needs. Um, gaming industry, what do they care about? They care about performance, latencies, and they care about collaboration. Um, and last, if you're in the CDN world, it's again about performance, accessibility, and availability, and most importantly, auto failover. What happens when something goes wrong? You just can't go blank, can you? So each of these workflow designs have different objectives depending on what your particular workflow is. But it's funny, when you look at the industry, we always like to paint them as these very simplistic flows. There's the ingest portion. Um, there's the editing and post-production stages. There's the transcoding stages to the different formats you need. Um, and then there's the digital archiving at the end of the day when you're finished with those assets. And we implement a digital asset man manager to manage all of that magically. And then we obviously uh, play that out into the different formats. So it looks fairly simple, right? I mean, you can design for that. But what if you want to change your production flow? What if you want to do something new, like take advantage of cloud bursting that our colleagues at Google talked about this week, just today? What if you want to be able to spin up 300 new cores in the cloud and take advantage of those for only three hours? How does that affect your workflow? What if you want to be able to use um, nonlinear editing, if you want to be able to use an old piece of an asset and change that around and use it in a new format? How do you get access to that? What if you want to change your, your um, backup policy from uh, you know, uh, off-siting to uh, local on-site and you want to have that always available? How does that change your workflow? Uh, there's a numerous of different things that are out there and these are problems that are facing anybody who is in this industry. How you manage your workflow is really very, very different depending on each one of you. And we like to call these the, it's the snowflake workflow. There isn't any one workflow that we can design as storage vendors that addresses your problems because each one of you has your own unique decisions that you want to do with your data. And so as an industry, these are the challenges that we're going to have to start addressing. How do we make infrastructure that allows you to be able to make your choices and make your unique uh, workflows happen? So as a company, the way we're looking at uh, changing the way we actually build out products is we're moving from what I would call a storage-centric world where we've really all we cared about was give us your bits and we'll put them on a disk or we'll put them on a piece of flash. And we're really starting to look at them more from the perspective of how do we help you with the problems you have. It's a data-centric world. So we have to look at it from the volume of data that you're going to be producing. And different workflows will have different amounts of data, but everybody's going to have a problem, I guarantee you. Um, and then there's the issue with the fast data. I saw some very, very interesting research um, that we've done internally as a company. You know, one of the, the ways that we help um, reduce costs for you is by making bigger and bigger disk drives. So that's great. We've gone from, you know, I remember the days when you couldn't get past, uh, was it 540? Uh, megabytes. Now we're at 10 terabyte drives. This is great for you because your dollar per gigabyte has just gone down at a great rate. But one of the challenges you have with that is if you look at the IOPS per gigabyte, you now have an inverse problem where your IOPS per gigabyte have gone massively down. So performance that you could get out of disk drives years ago, and by the way, we make them, we love disk drives, but we know there's a performance challenge you have. But as you start to talk about fast data, what do we care about? We care about IOPS, we care about latency. So our challenge is bringing back the ability to be able to offset the cost advantage you're getting with disk and be able to overcome that with the latency problems you have 
um, from, a, from a, in, an ingest pers perspective. And then, you know, our new nascent piece of the industry that truly is, really is in its infancy is all about edge analytics. And this is about concurrency um, and about having the right data to the right person at the right time so that you can monetize that piece of data as much as you possibly want to. And then, last but not least, is about um, getting insights into the data um, with real-time analytics. And so I want to specifically talk about um, media analytics because I truly believe that you've probably considered many of the, you know, the traditional workflows or what we know and understand. But let me introduce you to the new problems that are going to be coming down and that are going to be driven by your studios to, to figure out. Analytics, media analytics in particular, is a way that companies will be able to monetize the assets they've created in ways that we could never do before. And we're seeing a little bit of this with the internet aid companies that are doing it well, but it's going to come into the studios and how do you deliver point in time value to customers? And it's a fleeting moment. Think about that. You have a user, they're a certain age group, they're a certain sex, and you know they like a certain thing and you need to deliver point in time information to them, whether it's advertising, so that you can monetize that piece of content. Then that data stream, which is, you know, has to be accessed in real time, which means that virtually latency is like, there is no time like now when you have to deliver that data. So this is an extremely latency sensitive situation. That now gets fed into um, a kind of a real time analytics where you can look at whole communities and figure out, you know what? Every time we go to um, an ad uh, moment, we lose our audience. So what do we do about that? So now you're able to look at whole communities and figure out how whole communities can change the way that you can better monetize your content, or for that matter, figure out that the content you're giving them isn't what they want to see. So now let's not invest any more in that. And then finally, that gets fed back into an ever-increasing data lake where you will do batch analytics on it to figure out broader views of what people actually want to see because this is what's going to drive that initial production that you're going to make. All of this is extremely valuable data and I guarantee you none of it will be thrown away because you cannot, you cannot, throw, you cannot analyze what you don't have. And so the challenges around the media space are not just in the traditional world, but in the new worlds that we're bringing into the picture. So at HGST, you know, we've taken this approach of looking at the whole industry from a point of view of scalability. And scalability is kind of the ultimate thing, is being able to build on platforms just like we have with the i8 cloud. I mean, the, the cloud is great, but most of you in this room know that you, you know, it is incredibly difficult to use the cloud as your storage medium when you're talking petascale. And if anybody hasn't done the math, you can go on, there's a calculator on all of the major sites and you can figure out what it will cost you to put a petabyte of data on a public cloud for a year. And I assure you, you will not be putting it there. What you do want the cloud for is things like cloud bursting. You want to be able to access public cloud economics for your compute, which is extremely expensive, bursty, while your data remains secure and intact in-house. And that's what things like Avir, that Google talked about earlier, Avir Cloud Bursting offers for you. So what we're building is the underlying infrastructure that will give you choices like that with scalability and accessibility and global accessibility. So when you think about your traditional file systems, your traditional NAS, we talk about global file space. Um, it's a global file space inside of a local space. Is that global? Global file spaces are about global access from anywhere, anytime, any region. Um, and the kinds of things that we're going to be investing in from a strategic direction are having the ability to build, uh, to support apps, whatever cloud interface they talk, whether it's S3, whether it's Swift, there's futures coming down the pipe and building into the backup solutions from the 
from the, from the digital asset managers building into their solutions as a back end that allows you to be able to put the data on the platform, least platform of choice for you. Um, and things like um, being able to, in the future, run data analytics on it. So we're working on S3 connectors so you can run your Hadoop analytics on your compute um, and still pull that data out of your data lake. That are the kind of things you're going to want to be able to do. And last but not least, you've heard a lot about security today, but you have to be able to do that in a secure way. And so being able to burst to the cloud with encrypted data and bring it back in-house so your data never actually really leaves home, that's the kind of security you're going to need to have when you're building out your infrastructure. So we've talked a lot about kind of where we're going and what the issues are. So I want to talk about a little bit why object storage is so critical in that data path. Object storage, which is the foundation of what all major cloud vendors are using, is a fundamentally different way of building out the infrastructure so that you can scale to the cloud scale, mega, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte, you name it. That's where we are building. We are actually building exabyte level systems. And what that allows you is it gets rid of things like the complexities of fiber channel infrastructure. It gives you the ability to be able to offer services to your millennia. And by the way, I'm going to segue here for a little bit. Um, I had a very interesting, fun experience with my two-year-old niece. So she has grown up literally with an iPad strapped to her hand. She completely understands on demand. Recently, we were watching television. And she went up to the television, and she tried to stop it. I'm not kidding you. And we had a massive meltdown because she wanted to see her episode again. I tried to explain to her, this is, um, this is not how broadcast works. You have to, you, we'll, we'll get it online tomorrow. And she doesn't understand a world where she's not 100% in control of her media. OK, so now let's pan forward to the millennials that are going to be your designers, your editors in the future. Do you think any one of them is going to accept an answer from you as the infrastructure guy that says, oh, um, can you put a ticket in, please, for that piece of video that we wanted uh, from Toy Story 2? Can you put your piece of ticket in? We'll pull it out of the archives, and we'll have it back to you in three days. <laughs> I assure you, as an industry, the millennials are going to demand that you have always online, always access to every piece of content that they want now. And that will not work with tape vaulting. That will not work with people running into old archives and pulling out tapes and going through catalogs and trying to figure out where that piece of data is. They will expect to be able to do it from whatever their future iPad or whatever is. They expect to have instant access to that data. But things like single site failure, these are the kind of things that you will get with object storage. You can fail an entire site here in LA. You can have a catastrophic earthquake, but with things like erasure coding, which object storage comes inherently with, you will always have your data available because it's always on other geodistributed sites. So it's a fundamental way of allowing you to always satisfy your millennial future editors and geniuses who will want to have access to data. And it fundamentally will reduce the amount of uh, complexity in the system. Um, it also allows improved, uh, frankly, improved um, security on your media because you're not dealing with off-siting. You're able to control all of your data within your own cloud. And last but not least, improved accessibility. So my takeaways today in this talk is, I hope you go away with a sense of understanding that your data problem out through the next decade is not a 40% growth problem. It's a 100% growth problem. Because I know you're all wildly successful. But I want you to know that data growth is a real issue. And you're going to have to be looking at new ways to construct your media flows so that you can 
massively take advantage of the new technologies coming down the road that will make you more successful in being able to monetize your data. And it's all about creative ways of monetizing data. That's what it will come down to. Um, new technologies, we've talked a lot about cloud today, but object storage and cloud are going to be an essential piece of your portfolio of things that you can add. Um, we're going to be an NAB, so I invite you to come to our hall, come to our booth, find out more about the infrastructures we're building um, that will allow you to very cost competitively be able to offer the services that you really want to offer um, and visit our website. And so with that, I thank you very much for your time um, and uh, thank you. Questions? Absolutely agree with her 100%. Object storage is part of your future, period. Um, that's where we're going. Uh, for example, um, I've got um, a local fellow who helped put up an object storage, and they put up a petabyte of object storage. And they were able to put this up on three different sites um, so that they would be able to do the post-production work, have it on set, another location in their location, and they were able to put the structure up for about $70,000 for a petabyte. Now, of course, this is them doing it homegrown, uh, but looking at those economies of scale over some of the traditional costs and storage systems, is really critical in your workflow nowadays. Um, absolutely. And, and I think the truth is there's a, there's a view that somehow or another storage is, you know, it's expensive. And I truly believe that if people look at the economics of the whole workflow and what you get from putting your data fundamentally in a data lake, that's where we're yep. going. There's going to be two layers of life. Fast data for those latency issues I talked about and a big data lake. And the key thing is having your data lake in, under your control because that's how you'll be able to um, offer the services you want to offer. Thank you. Good presentation, Barbara. Uh, you mentioned something about the millennials and when they whine about having to wait for that content, do we have to serve cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. So, so, so I've actually seen this on the opposite side for the engineers supporting things. Um, that's one of the issues Guillaume ran into. His engineers simply won't accept it. This is not a reasonable thing to not to be able to get to our data in a timely manner because I'm moving a million miles an hour today getting these things done and I need that and I need that now. But as you were just saying a second ago, it really gets into eventually the data lakes and being able to apply um, search and all these interesting analytics to that data eventually. That's absolutely critical in the future for making additional revenues, figuring things out, understanding what's hot, what's cold, how you structure everything. And I can give you a great example of a, a customer design win. It's going to come out soon and, and press release, but I'm going to sneak preview it to you because I think it's very interesting about how, how it's changing. We have, has anybody heard of the Montreux Jazz Festival? Okay. If you love jazz, the Montreux Jazz Festival is the premier jazz festival in Europe. They have 40 years of tape of every single concert, every single performance for 40 years. And in conjunction with EPFL, which is a, a university in Switzerland, they've created a mobile app. And what they're now doing is they're digitizing the best of the concerts. And they're tagging them. So you can now get a mobile app, and for one euro, you can purchase you know, Sting 1976 concert at the Montreux Jazz Festival, and you can stream that to your, to your iPhone or your iPad, and you get to keep that piece of thing. So they have figured out how, it's a nonprofit, so making money is really important to them, but they figured out how by creating an entire digital archive and digital repository of this data, they're now able to monetize what was basically you know, junk sitting in archive somewhere where nobody even knew what it was. And this is the kind of thing where you look at all of the years and years of great content that's frozen in time and being able to actually bring that back to life and monetize it. Um, and you know, it's with a cloud architecture. They have you know, a typical mobile. Uh, phone type access, so it feels just like going to the cloud for anything else, but they figured out how to take what was effectively dead, and I use the word dead, dead content,
bring it back to life, um, and they're having a tremendous success with it. In fact, I just saw a great uh, press article about it recently in the newspapers. And that's one of the things that we've been part of, helping that happen. Because you have to have low-cost storage to be able to do that. You have to be doing it on, basically, object, cloud, really low-cost storage so that you can get advantage and be able to monetize it um, in a good way.